So hello, and thank you for joining us for tonight's event. My name is Bailey, and I'm an event host here at Pals Books in Portland, Oregon. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual and in-person events by visiting our website at pals.com and clicking on the events tab at the top of the page. Please remember to follow us on our various social media channels, such as Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Tonight, we're honored to welcome Cara Block in conversation with William Kent Kruger to discuss Cara's novel, Murder at the Port de Versailles. In the wake of 9-11, Paris is living in a state of fear. For Amy LeDuc, November is bittersweet. The anniversary of her father's death and her daughter's third birthday fall on the same day. A gathering for family and friends is disrupted when a bomb goes off at the police laboratory and Boris Viard, the partner of Amy's friend Michou, is found unconscious at the scene of the crime with traces of explosive, explosives under his fingernails. Amy doesn't believe Boris set the bomb. In an effort to prove this, she battles the police and his own lab colleagues collecting conflicting eye eyewitness reports. Murder at the Port de Versailles is the riveting 20th installment in Cara Block's Amy LeDuc investigation series. Cara Block is the author of 20 books in the New York Times bestselling Amy LeDuc series, as well as the thriller, Three Hours in Paris. She is joining us from Pasadena, California. Cara will be joined in conversation by William Kent Kruger. Kent is the author of This Tender Land, Ordinary Grace, Devil's Bed, and a mystery series set in the North Woods of Minnesota. His last nine novels were all New York Times bestsellers. He is calling in from his home in St. Paul, Minnesota. This evening's event will also include a Q&A. Please use the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question at any time. If someone has already typed a question that you'd also like to know the answer to, please upvote that particular question. Perhaps most importantly, please support Cara, Kent, and Powell's by purchasing a copy of Murder at the Port de Versailles or any of William's books. Keep an eye out in the chat where I'll be sharing links to purchase these books. Uh, I do want to note that due to supply chain issues, uh, Murder at the Port de Versailles is available on our website for pre-order, but will be in our stores sometime next week. Pre-orders will include a signed book plate while supplies last. Now let's give a warm virtual welcome to Cara Black and William Kent Kruger. Yay, Cara. Thank you, yay, Kent. Thank, Thank you, you Bailey. Bailey. Thank you very much for that introduction. You know, I have to be honest, Bailey took all my thunder. I was going to introduce you and say all the all those things that Bailey said. But now I'll say a few things that Bailey didn't say. Uh, <laughs> yes, we're here to talk about number 20 in your Emile Le Duc series, um, Murder at the, the uh, Port de Versailles. Um, and, and as Bailey mentioned, though, you are also the author of, at this point, a single standalone, Three Hours in Paris, which was, I have to tell everybody, was one of my absolute favorite novels of last year. I just thought it was a stunning piece of work. Thank you, um, Thank you Ken. Your books have made um, all of the, you know, best books of the year lists time and time again. You've actually become kind of an icon in the mystery community, which happens when you publish 21 highly acclaimed novels. Um, and you've been nominated for and won just a slew of awards, both here in the States and also in France, as I understand it. Well done. And you are an international sensation. Uh, yeah. yeah, does all this go to your head? Yeah, totally. No, but not with you. We're old friends. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you have always been the, the modest type. You know, uh, just for the uh, for the audience, so they understand our relationship, we're old friends. You published your first novel, Murder in the Marais, in 1999, which was a year after I published my first novel, Iron Lake, uh, in 1998. And, um, and a what, two, maybe three years after that, we did a long tour uh, through the East, uh, visiting such places as uh, Monticello. Or mm -hmm. is it Monticello? Thomas Jefferson's house? It was yeah. amazing. Is it Monticello or Monticello? <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so we've done a number of, a, of road trips that had a lot of adventures together. And it's, uh, Cara, I have to say, you were always one of my favorite people to talk to. I love being in conversation with you. Well, thank you. And I love, you know, meeting you at voucher cons or when we can, and we, we can have a coffee and a drink and we talk, you know, we talk over stuff and you've always been so encouraging, especially, you know, since I was, I was very scared to dip that toe in the water and write a standalone after, you know, writing so many Amy LeDuc books, which I have returned to. And, but, but, you know, you kind of gave me some confidence and said, well, 
you know, dip your toe in there. And my editor did, did too. And, and it was great. You know, it's, you use different muscles, Kent. And I think you have always said that to me, just you've got the muscles, they need to be exercised. You know, we're artists. I think all art, all writers should think of themselves as artists. And you ought to always be trying to, to push the envelope, you know, push your limitations, a stretch. And you certainly did that with uh, Three Hours in Paris. And, you know, I got to tell you, we'll talk about this later. I think I saw, I clearly saw the influence of that book in your newest uh, Amy. Really? Uh, we're going to talk about that. Okay. So, um, although uh, Bailey did a pretty good job of sort of letting readers in on um, what uh, what this newest is about, uh, why don't you give your own sort of elevator version of Murder at the Port de Versailles? Sure. Well, it's set right, you know, right after 9-11. And, uh, and I was really fascinated to know what did that mean in France, you know, and France is so used to, you know, all this kind of, there's a lot of bombings in France. And what really snagged my interest was that in Toulouse, you know, down south, where there's the aerospace industry, like the NASA of France, there was a, an explosion, really big, about 10 days after 9-11. Now, did we hear about it here? No. 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 And I think there were a lot of things that the, uh, we, know, we don't know about that were diffused, you know, or almost happened. So, um, so that was just something to play with, but it was just sort of the backdrop of that time. And I really wanted to, I wanted that to come out. I also thought this story, here's Amy LeDuc, she, her, she's kind of really upset about her father's, you know, anniversary of his death. Yet she, she's got her three-year-old who she loves to bits. She's got this birthday party. She's, you know, and then she's uh, really have struggling with Malak, who is the biological father of Chloe, who's back in the scene. You know, he's pushing her. He's constantly saying, why don't you move up to Brittany? And, you know, then, you know, Chloe will have the sea air. I have goats, you know, we grow vegetables. I have horses, you know, and you can work in IT up there. The, the uh, ministry has different kind of satellite uh, intelligence. I don't know, IT stuff. And she's thinking, wow, well, you know, for Aimee Le Duc, she, she really needs to be where there's a cafe a block away. And <laughs> in Brittany, if there was a cafe after the cow pasture, okay, maybe. So, but she's also struggling inside, you know, that's, that feels selfish, you know, and, you know, because it's, it's denying her daughter the opportunity to grow up, you know, in, in beautiful Brittany, you know, in the countryside. And, you know, is she, is she, she feels guilty. And then Malak is constantly pressuring her to during the story. So I, I just thought that was sort of just a little subtext. You know, she's constantly dealing with that because she's a woman. She runs her own business. She's got to keep that afloat. She's got to keep the apartment going. She's, you know, got this pressure from Malak. She's got childcare issues. She's, you know, she has paying clients, right? I mean, as a PI, a lot of people say, oh, isn't she a cop? No. <laughs> She's not a fleet. She's a PI. So she has clients who pay her, you know, and she's got to satisfy them. And she's gone away from, you know, being in the field to, to doing the expert court testimony as an expert witness to give her more time with Chloe. So that's just something when all this happens. And it's a very, I feel, I don't know, a very personal story for her because Boris, who she loves dearly and old friends and he rushes off to get Chloe's birthday present that he forgot and left on his desk at work at the police lab. And then he's found in the rubble. And she feels totally committed, you know, sometimes, you know, um, a lot of time. I think it's important that there's a personal reason she's doing this. And she, there's an honor and, and another theme in this is it's a witnessing. You know, yeah, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that later on, because that's an interesting uh, issue in this. Um, yeah, you know, I, I'm glad that you talk about this being a really personal story, because you do so many things so well in your stories, uh, not the least Thank of you. which is characterization. And I want to talk about some of the characters involved. But I, I want to begin with Amy, who is, she is really a, a pretty unique protagonist. In, uh, in our genre. She's 
She's been really kick-ass all along. She's, she's so smart. She's so funny. She's uh, lovely, beautiful. And, and now she's a mom. And what an interesting curveball to throw at Amy uh, at this point in her life. So could you talk a little bit about where, what was the genesis for Amy? Where did she come from? And um, how you have seen her develop across the course of, you know, now 20 books in the series? Sure, good question, Ken. But you forgot fashionista. She's a fashionista. You know, fashionista. fashion is really, hey, really I'm a guy. important. I don't think about fashionista. <laughs> right. And, and her daughter, three years old, running around in those yeah. little zebra boots and will sleep in them, <laughs> you know, following in mom's footsteps. Um, yeah. So, I mean, when I met Amy Leduc many years ago, I didn't know who she was. I just knew I couldn't write as a French woman, you know, because I can't even, I'm not wearing a scarf, but I've got my, my little um, necklace from Monoprix. Um, you know, I couldn't write as a French woman, but I thought, you know, and I was reading Sarah Paretsky and Sue Grafton, kind of the, you know, hot trailblazing women in our genre for women. And I was like, yeah, what if, what if she was like part French, you know, because she could, you know, have this other American side to her so we can, see she's a bit of out of the mold I, I think so then I started interviewing some French female detectives now this was oh, wow yeah in the early 90s okay so it's different now there were three female detectives who ran their own agency in Paris swear to god and I talked to those three and they were all very different you know uh, one of them I stole the history Madame Duluc and used her because her father ran it. She inherited it and her grandfather before that. So I sort of stole their history, you know, the location, the look detective. I talked to another woman who uh, was like in her 60s. She was like a grandmother type. She had always worked in the military and she and her husband ran a detective agency. Wow. And she was doing active surveillance. One time, one time. Because who would suspect a grandma? <laughs> that's what she said. Look at me. I have my shopping cart with a leak sticking out. I have my hairnet on. I can do surveillance all week. No one pays attention to old women. She was really good. But she said she had hired a young woman who I got to meet, who went to the clubs, the Boite Louis, you know, who was with the young crowd. I met her and she, she took me in her car and she also had a motorcycle. So when she was trailing people, she could, you know, take her motorcycle and then get out and get in her car. In the back of her car, she had changes of clothing so that she could, you know, go into a store, come out with something else. So, you know, what people think, oh, Amy's so, you know, so out there. It's, it's I think, what detectives do, you know, when they're surveilling someone, when they're, you know, and a woman's got it easy, right? They can just change their hat, put their coat inside out. I mean, men do as well, but they can, put makeup on to look older or younger. I think they've got a little more um, advantage, I think, in her tricks. And the other woman I talked to was really into IT. So it was really great at that time. So I kind of took them together. Plus I took a friend of mine who, who is just smart, witty, gorgeous, and has so much trouble with men. I just don't, I, I don't get it. I, I've met her after work, you know, in a club and she's, oh, he broke up with me again. I'm like, what? You? <laughs> There's no hope for the rest of us, you know, if, but, but, you know, I think it's important to know, I mean, no matter what we look like on the appearance, you know, outside, it's, we're, we're human beings and people are vulnerable. And um, so I sort of took people and, you know, gave her a detective agency. Uh, but before we go any further, I just want to make sure everybody sees the great cover of your book. Thank you. Which is, uh, will be um, available and you can pre-order right now. It'll be mm -hmm. coming to uh, Powell's fairly soon, delayed because of those stupid um, um, chain, you know, problems, supply chain problems. Right, book bindery. But, and I will sign um, book plates for you. So I, can, I will send it to Powell's for sure. And at this point, I'm just going to remind everybody who's watching that you can ask uh, Kara a question uh, by putting it in the queue down at the bottom of your screen. There should be a little icon for you, Q&A icon. Click on that and uh, ask uh, Kara a question and we'll get to those 
you know, if you give us some interesting ones, we might get to go those sooner, but we'll definitely get to them <laughs> uh, after, after our conversation. Um, you know, I, this is this is not what I was going to ask you, but I, I do have, Aimee <gasps> it, it is so good with the, the computer stuff. Is that you? <laughs> You would ask me that, wouldn't you, Ken? You know the answer. No, my neighbor is French and he works for Google. <laughs> no, now he moved to Apple. I ask him everything. Okay. Because he was in IT or whatever we called it then in the 90s in, in France, you know? Wow. And Whoa. so he's, he's this treasure trove. And I say, what? He goes, Kari, no, no, no. Remember, it's dial up. I'm like, oh, yeah, you know? So it's just to keep keep you know the feet on the ground there that we remember now i can't get too technical because who cares and who remembers now but we do some of us remember dial up right yeah. and renee is always you know trying to get the dial up going um so i do get ideas from him and it's also important to remember as i understand it is that a lot of the things that renee does the computer you know genius the it guy who happens to be vertically challenged He's doing things. He has friends in Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley, and they send things, programs to him. And he beta tests. Is that correct? There's alpha and beta. He beta tests like a program, part of a game, part of a this, part of a widget, a what, you know, whatever. And so as friends, these computer geeks, you know, send things back and forth and try them out. So actually, Renee was doing, and I think it was in Murder Below Montparnasse, when Amy is riding on her bike and Renee's telling her, no, go left, no, turn right now, okay, at that street. He was doing, he was using a friend's early version of MapQuest, you know, telling her, go, you know, and telling her in her headphones and she could hear it. So a lot of these things, like Google was not Google as we know it, but a lot of these things were being tried out. There were prototypes, there were, you know what I mean? It, no, it yeah. was never yeah. born fully, Formed. So he has a lot of that insight. So I can jump ahead a little bit, you know, because he would in theory be doing that, you know, before it got to the consumer. You're so blessed. What a great neighbor to have. <laughs> I, I, you know, I treat him nicely. You know, I buy him champagne once in a while. We're getting some questions. Should. We're getting some questions, but I'm going to still hold off on the questions just a little while because there are a few things I want to uh, to ask you on my own before we get to the questions. For me, this was in large measure. I mean, it's a great suspenseful story, but a lot of it is really about family. It's about what binds us together, and Amy has created Amy has created this family around her, and now one of the the family has been threatened, and they all need to come together. So you've got you've got Renee, of course, and you've got Michu, and you've got uh, Boris and uh, Belan. Is how you spell say his name and. Mm -hmm. Mor Mordier, what an interesting character. Mordier, the big cheese. Mordier, yes. <laughs> Mordier, what an interesting character he is. Malak, who sometimes gets on my nerves. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and of course, Chloe. Could, could you talk about where some of these characters came from in your, in your thinking? Yeah. Well, Belan, we have met way earlier in the story. I believe it was Murder in the Bastille. He was um, he was uh, under her fa Amy's father's tutelage when he went, you know when he taught at the police academy before that all blew up. But um, and he always said that Belan was like the best cop he ever trained. He was just you know he had the gift. He had the you know this. He was really wonderful. And then when Amy's father was and and Belan uh, sort of idol idolized him, hero worshipped him. And when Amy's father was found to be corrupt, which he wasn't taking the fall. Right. Um, yeah, and Amy later vindicated him that Belan couldn't accept it. You know, it was like he hated him. He wouldn't talk to him. It was over, right? He believed everything. He sided with the, and I'll get this wrong, code of blue, the blue code. You know, you you always have the cop, you know, in, in the cop speak, you never, you know, rat on a, on a fellow comrade, you, you know. You, 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 that's an important part of what goes on in this story. Yeah, yeah. So Belan was, that was who Belan was. But Belan also had a Down syndrome son, which we sort of meet in Murder in the Bastille. He has two daughters and his wife, and they break up because she can't stand being a, a fleek's wife. But he's having a very hard time accepting his Down syndrome son, Guillaume. 
And it, it's very much, you know, what this kind of macho guy is and what happens and how that changes and how Guillaume actually sort of helps him solve his, you know, investigation. So I, he came back in, um, yeah, I think murder in Saint-Germain. We meet Belan who now has custody of Guillaume and who loves him to death and is, that's all the dynamic is changing. And uh, I really and enjoyed trying... that. I enjoyed that aspect of it in uh, in the new book. We we go back. We see him trying to be a good father, trying to balance, you know, his responsibilities uh, in his job with his uh, his responsibilities and his love for his family. I loved that. Nicely done. Thank you. Yeah, I think he really has grown, and he, you know, he's living in in the in the maid's room way up in the top in the <laughs> attic, you know, with just so he can be close. But so, um, so I thought he, I think he's grown a lot. And, and I, some people have, you know, contacted me and said they really appreciate that. And I said, thank you, because he's really a special person, apart from everything else that happens in right. the story, um, because he's very good at what he does. I'm and sure he uses people. I'm sure you've been asked this often, but why did you uh, choose to make Rene vertically challenged? Why did you choose to make him a dwarf? Well, Kent, um, when I was a preschool teacher and long ago in dinosaur days, <laughs> we um, we had uh, we were going to hire a new preschool teacher in our school. I was on I was a teacher hire, on a hiring committee, and we had many applicants, and all of them were you know had credentials, they had their certificates, experience, and one of the applicants was a was a dwarf, and I remember thinking, and you know shamefully, that she was not much taller than our children you know mm -hmm. and you know in a preschool you're constantly lifting and putting and it's a very physical job you've got to reach for things you you know and so there was that and then I also thought shamefully that what if the children didn't respect her what if they laughed at her okay I I did think that whatever happened we as a as a committee voted we hired someone else a couple of months later, I was at our sister preschool down at the uh, Ferry Building. And I went early because I wanted to see this art project that one of the teachers was doing. I went to, I wanted to go steal it and get some ideas for our art projects, right? <laughs> and we share. I go early, you know, and I sit down and, you know, the low table, the children are wearing their paint smocks, they're all involved and they're everything you know and they're bringing the materials they're putting them away and they're like wow it's like really Montessori and I couldn't find the teacher you know and I'm looking and I'm looking and of course the teacher was at the table right in the middle of it with the kids working with them the woman we did not hire right and I went oh you know geez you know first of all I felt oh, that's terrible and guilty but I also felt what an opportunity we missed for our kids to have these learn, you know, these life lessons, you know. And so I've always felt bad about that. And I think I'm expiating my guilt with <laughs> Renee. But poor Renee is constantly, you know, people see his appearance first. Right. But he's so in, he is so incredibly good at what he does. Uh, you know, uh, someone, one of the uh, uh, people uh, who's watching commented on, she's wondering where, uh, or he, wondering are any of the the characters inspired by people in your own life well the you know renee was inspired right. by this woman um and i met several people you know who were vertically challenged who gave me a lot of insight into what it's like um i met um a man who was an actor and he was you know i met him in berkeley at a, like a wine bar and we get there and he was sitting on a stool and we we're talking and I'm thinking, how am I going to approach my question sensitively, you know, and say the right thing. And, and he, you know, he started talking and then like two minutes into the conversation, he was whining and moaning like any actor does. I just got back from LA. I didn't, you know, with all these additions. He's just like any other guy. And I'm like, yeah, okay, I get it. So there's things that you kind of get from people. Um, and again, the detective, Amy, you know, bits and pieces come from the detectives I met, from my friend. Um, yeah, they just come, Morbier, um, he comes from, I love the film actor, I'm sure many people know, Philippe Noiret, who sadly left us, right? We, we Il Postino, I mean, he's many other, he, but in French movies, he always played a dirty cop and he was so good at it, you know, I loved him. And so I like to bring that because we never really know with Morbier, right? 
he's always, you know, he's got something going, playing somebody against the middle, I feel. So, you know, I'm going to uh, I have a question here, and a number of people have, uh, have essentially asked the same sort of a question. Um, your plots are intricate. They are, you have many threads. And oftentimes when I read one of your books, I'm going, how the hell is she going to tie all of these things together eventually? And you eventually always do in a really satisfying, logical way. So the, the question is, how do you do that? Have you ever backed yourself into a corner? How do you go about creating the plots that, um, that you use for your stories? Well, thank you. Well, Kent, in our, you know, tra travels on book tours, I've often run ideas by you or at VoucherCon grabbing a coffee, or I'm sure I'll take you aside next week at Tucson. But, but you know, I talk with people and I, I think, but I think the, the main thing is, yes, putting them, you know, in a corner and have, seeing how they get out of it. Often, oh, I've always been in a corner. Um, there was one murder in Clichy. I was, I'd written three quarters of the book and I was like, I don't know. I think, you know, I had a, I had a villain, okay? And then I went to do the laundry. I went downstairs of my house. I have a top loader and I took the wet clothes. I was putting them in the dryer in this motion. I'm like, no, he's, he's not the killer. You know, I can't say the gender. It's, it's this person. What's the matter with me? Of course, it's this person. I had set the seeds up, you know, planted, I'm sorry, set, planted the seeds. And all I had, I, went, I ran upstairs, I was like, oh my, I'm going to have to rewrite the whole book. You no, know? because those seeds were there. My subconscious had planted them that I could maneuver things. So, so that was great. Um, but now I really think um, I've changed a bit. And I always want to, I start with, the place, the location, which is a character in the story. Why is Amy LeDuc going to be in this location? What is she doing here? What is the sort of theme? What's, what's this place uh, known for? And then I think, who is out to get who? And because it's the villain who orchestrates the plot. We don't have a book if we don't have a villain who commits a crime, at least in my, my books, you know, in our genre. And so behind the scenes, the villain is orchestrating this. A good villain is as smart or smarter than Amy, than the character, than the protagonist. So they're constantly, you know, by whatever, putting roadblocks in the way, obstacles, changing things, lying, you know, putting, getting other people to come in and witness. And so that really helps when I start to think from the villain's point of view, you know, how can I make this hard? How can I get away with this? Because the stakes are so high for the villain, right? That's the, that's the point. They're willing to go to, go to you know, what it, do whatever it takes. I hope that answered the question kind of. Um, yeah, that was, uh, that answered it more or less. I, I would pursue that <laughs> a bit more, but let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I said up front that um, the Three Hours in Paris was just such a stunning novel. It was so suspenseful. It was, um, atmospheric it was that the language is just beautiful thank you and i gotta say that i saw in uh, murder at the port de versailles a lot of the things that i saw in three hours in paris this is incredibly suspenseful the pace is breakneck in this story once once we're out of the party and the explosion happens and things get going it, it's hard to catch your breath um it, uh, you know, I, I, yeah, <laughs> it was incredible in that regard. Well, I'm I thinking, wrote it during the pandemic, so maybe. <laughs> when, when, when we all had chance to really focus on things. But you seemed surprised when I said I, 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 th I saw the influence of uh, Three Hours in Paris on this particular work, particularly in how you created all of those suspenseful moments and how you just kept the pace relentless. You, 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 hey, do you care to comment on that? Well, thank you. It's quite nice of you to say that. Um, I know that with, um, that with three hours in Paris, you have a, I mean, a female sniper, an American woman from backwoods, Oregon, who is, you know, uh, recruited by the British um, service. One of the branch, one of the many secret branches of the secret service in World War II. 
yeah. um, and sent to Paris to assassinate Hitler. We know that Hitler did go to Paris and he went for three hours and left and never returned. And there's a lot of, I don't want to, you know, conflicting reasons about different dates that he was actually there. But, okay, spoiler alert, she doesn't shoot Hitler, okay? <laughs> so from, the, from there, it's cat and mouse, right? She's got to get out of there. I mean, getting chased by Nazis who, you know, are going to get, you know, that's a, you can't really rest. You can't, you can't go and have your chocolate at La Durée or anything. You're, you you got to keep moving, you know, I mean, and it's, it's taken over by Germans. So there's this impetus, right, to, to get away and then to find something out and to, to escape. And then the other uh, person, Gunther, who is the German cop who, um, I have to say, I was influenced by Philip Kerr, Bernie Gunther series. Um, so what my homage was to call him Gunther. Um, but he is also, he's a very good cop, you know, a German. Uh, he was from Munich and he, you know, was a product of the of Weimar Republic. And he also, you know, I mean, he's good at what he does. He has a code too, you know, and his code is to catch this, but of course he doesn't care for the Fuhrer. So, and, and, you know, he's being, you know, all this backbiting and everything. So they're both under incredible stress. She also discovers something. So, but first of all, she's just got to get out of Dodge, right? She's got to escape Paris, you know, and and he's got to find her. And then there's all these other people, you know, the, um, the underground. So I felt that was great to watch, to write, because I could I could do it, uh, but time-wise, you know, three o'clock, he would be doing this, she would be doing that, you know, whatever, because, and I gave them 36 hours. So there was this ticking, right? And in uh, and in the new book, there is this ticking. You're trying to get um, answers to um, to who really is at the heart of this, because Boris is being blamed for it uh, before Boris maybe dies. Um, before, so there is there is a ticking clock involved in this as well. And I I, I found it really interesting how you very often use just it was like um, editing in a in an action movie, very short very short uh, sections and it would be a time section and then the next piece would be a time section a little bit later and the next and it was just this uh, constant watching of the clock i thought it was just a tremendously effective technique in this and again i gotta think i gotta think that somehow um three hours in paris really influenced how you're going to structure this this story that's how i read it at any rate yeah, you know, I, I, don't, I wasn't consciously thinking of it, but I just thought she needs to be under pressure, you know, because Boris was, you know, oh my God, what if, you know, she had to vindicate him and all this. So, yeah, but, you know, I do like to read those kind of books, too. So maybe, you know, I like them, you know, I mean, but most of Amy's books are, you know, we are, happen within a few days or a week at, at max. So we've always been kind of quick, you know. Uh, there are a number of questions about Paris itself, but I'm going to hold those for a bit. I want to continue to focus on the, the book for a little bit longer. You know, you have a wonderful character who I just, I, I, I liked a great deal, felt for him a great deal. And that was the young, the kid, Hugo. Um, and Hugo sees something he shouldn't see, which is always not a good thing in our genre. <laughs> Can you tell me where Hugo came from? Hugo came from my friend, okay? <laughs> and yes, my friend who I, who is not named Hugo. I actually, when I wrote, I won't say his name, but when I, a French guy, when I wrote, I put his name in and then I realized just before copy, I just, oh my God, I can't use his real name. So he became Hugo. But he was, um, he told me uh, when his, he's from the 15th arrondissement where the story takes place. He lived, his family apartment was across from the, uh, from the police laboratory where the bomb went off wow. because this whole enclave is the police laboratory you know which does yep. blood chemicals and all that and then you've got they don't do the fingerprints unless they're bloody food then further down you've got the bomb unit with the arson and all of them there then you've got the main um uh lost and found of paris where they all go eat off of food but and then you've got the park so it's all it's like an enclave and so he lived across and he remembers as a young boy waking up in the middle of the night, this noise, and he was on the floor. He'd fallen out of bed from this or thrown out of bed from an explosion. And there was a bomb set off in front of the police laboratory. 
And in the morning, you know, he was like, oh, what happened? And his parents told him, you know, what really happened. And there really was a bomb there. It was done by a Basque separatist. So Basques, you know, they want to be separate from Spain or whatever, and or France. So, but but Basques, the bombing, he said, but Kari, you have to understand, it was okay because there's a special kind of bombing. No one ever gets hurt. It's a political statement. Do you know what I mean? So, okay, whatever. So he said, you know, we are kind of used to that. So, and I was like, that's kind of amazing. At the same time, I met a, inter, a guy who worked at Interpol um, and he said, well, you know, Interpol, before it moved to Lyon, where it is now, it was out just, just across from the 15th arrondissement in Boulogne. Um, and they had a building and Interpol was there when it was smaller. And he was working at Interpol. He was an agent. And he said there was a bombing, 1986, 87. It was, um, you know, and it was in the LA Times, a bombing somewhere in Interpol. And I, he also introduced me to, I only, I can only think this guy's CIA. He called me from Algeria and he was there. <laughs> and he told me. I can't use his name and he, he, I couldn't call him. He had to call me at a certain time. And I just used what he told me because it was factual. I mean, he was there, you know, and told me about it and about how he had, to, I just learned so much. It was fascinating. So, so I really thought I have to use that. So you, you just touched on one of the questions I was going to ask, which is about, you must have done amazing research for this because you go into the technicalities of so many aspects of the investigation and you you acknowledge so many people uh, at the end of the story. Could you talk about how, how you made your contacts, what they were willing to share with you, or or were there lines that they drew that they would not go beyond? There's all kinds of answers to that question, you know, but I mean, as mystery writers, like you do. I mean, we all have our sources, you know, uh, police or people in bomb explosives or different arson. Um, and, you know, I've been writing these for 22 years. So I've made contacts. I know people now, now a lot of these guys are retiring, right? I mean, they're older and they can, I can take them to lunch and they can tell me more because <laughs> do you it's apply okay them now. Without, do you apply them with alcohol first? Very good wine, yes. Yeah, there mm -hmm. you go. They're French. I mean, yes, of course. <laughs> oh, sure. So they get talking, you know, they start talking. But I also I also do the what ifs. Well, what if this happened? Or, you know, and I test my what ifs and they say we'd never do that, or no, this is the way we did it, or why didn't why don't you think about doing it this way? Because you know, and I'm like, well, yeah. So I, I really put it by them. Of course, it's fiction, but I take these things that sometimes they tell me. I was introduced to the arson a specialist who works in that part of that bombing enclave yeah. the, where the bomb is. And uh, the man who was a coroner for the French, now he does expert testimony as a coroner. He introduced me we, and we went to lunch and he was late and he said, I'm so sorry I'm late and everything. And we said, no problem. He said, yeah, I was just, you know, investigating the Notre Dame fire. You know, he was one of the first people and he had to write a report. He's the specialist, you know. So we're saying no problem, <laughs> but he was talking about that. So, and then, and then I became very good friends with the female, the woman who runs the police laboratory, the biological police laboratory, who gave me, um, who invited me to her house. She took me out into the park and she goes, Cara, this is where you should put a body. Seriously, this woman, she said, why don't you, you know, so they're, they're kind of frustrated. I think, you know, kind of, they read detective novels and they go, but, but what I found in all my experience, and I'm sure you have too, is that they want you to get it right. And they spend, they certainly spend time telling you, you know, they don't want it to be like on TV where it's, uh, what are all those things? And all of a sudden there's this thing and they're writing on these clear plastic and they know what's happened and DNA solves everything. No. You know. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know about you, but when I first began uh, doing the kind of research that's necessary for the kind of books that we write, um, and I would approach uh, a, a sheriff or, uh, or a homicide detective or an FBI agent. I would think, why, why, do they, why are they going to want to talk to me? And I just found them so willing to talk and so eager to share their, their information. Um, and they were really all proud of what they did. And that, that, that showed. Exactly. Yeah, they are. They, you know, they have pride in their work, you know. 
And though there are some people who are corrupt in the force, and we know that, and in this story, there are people that are dicey, but there's always people who are working for the good of everyone. You know, we can't slight those people as well, you know? You know, um, up top, you, you mentioned the fact that one of the issues that you wanted to deal with in this story, and you, I thought you dealt with it effectively, is the reluctance of witnesses often to come forward and help in an investigation. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. I, um, when I talk to cops, you know, I say, well, you know, I asked them about things and they, and they told me, I said, like, people lie to us. People lie to us all the time. You know, people don't like cops, uh, you know, and uh, I think that's universal. <laughs> But, you know, of course, when I was writing this, also, uh, there was the George Floyd incident, too, yeah. you know, and the My whole thing the about woods. your neck of the woods. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, all that, the witnessing and everything. And then I thought, oh, I never lied to the police. And I thought, how many times have I said, but officer, I didn't know I was, you know, going, you know, you know, we all, I mean, I have, anyway, I'll speak for myself, of course. You know, you try and get away with things on your taxes, not that I ever have, but you know what I mean? But why do people lie and especially why do they lie when it's someone's life is on the line too or you know it's really important but people are we're all kind of well i know i would be if i witnessed something and maybe i was you know in the wrong place at the wrong time i was not supposed to be there and if i witnessed it then i people would find out i was you know there what if i was um you know having an affair you know and then the you know i mean what if I had just stolen, you know, 50,000 euros, francs, now we're back in France. What if I had stolen 50,000 francs and I'm trying to get through the crowd to get to the train, you know? And, and so I think we all have our own reasons for lying about something. And, um, and it's about the responsibility of witnessing, you know? What is, don't we have a responsibility apart from our needs or, or, or whatever fears we have about doing that? So I think a lot of people do that and I wanted to explore it. And especially with Hugo, I mean, look at him. I mean, when I thought what, what I did, you know, how I lied to my parents, <laughs> it was like, you know, you think about that, you know, but it's so important yet, you know, I, 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 think, I think it was also just a precursor for Aimee. It's kind of like, she's thinking, oh, my daughter's gonna be a teenager in 10 years. Oh my God, you know, what's gonna happen, right? So, I mean, it is true that, that there's all kinds of reasons that we lie and that we do not, you know, be responsible when we're witnessing something. Maybe we're afraid, maybe we can't, maybe we'll lose our job, maybe we'll, you know, it could be many things. I thought, so, you, I thought you did well showing both sides of that. Um, Amy is concerned about getting the truth and can only get to the truth if you're willing to tell me. And on the other side, I'm afraid to tell you for all kinds of reasons. Um, yeah. Thank well, the, you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we, we're still going to get to the Paris questions, but. <laughs> Is that Cheryl asking a question? I can't see the, I can't see the questions. <laughs> but anyway. Um, well, let, we're, we're about a quarter till. Let's go ahead and take the, <laughs> the obvious Paris questions, which are, uh, do you often visit Paris? Um, how do you decide on the arrondissement where you're going to set it? Uh, people who are asking these questions clearly know Paris well, admire uh, and love what you do with the city. So could you talk a little bit about your relationship to, to Paris, how you go about the, re the actual location research? Um, sure. Well, I, you know, I'm, I was actually, after two years, I went back to, to France in September. I did a workshop in Bordeaux, a writing workshop so amazing we did it in a chateau you know it was pretty oh, cool uh, um yeah, really yeah it, it was really tough Ken. i was uh, you know i had to suffer um and drink really good wine it was just awful <laughs> of course <laughs> it was amazing anyway um but i'm going in april that's why i'm gonna miss love Coast crime but i'm doing an event there but i before you know pandemic i was going twice a year once a year I have a friend I can stay at her place, sleep on a couch, you know, that's how I do it. And, you know, over the years, well, the first book, Murder in the Marais, my first ever book, took place in the Marais because the story was about my friend's mother, a hidden Jewish girl during the German occupation in Paris. She hid there. So I wanted to write that story. I knew her. It was 
So that's why it was set there. And I thought that was it. Then my editor said, well, where's Amy LeDuc going next? And I said, excuse me? Well, you're writing a series, aren't you? You got dog and man. So I said, how about Belleville? Now this was before the triplets of Belleville, okay? And Laura, who was my editor, goes, Belleville, Illinois? No, no, it's Belleville. <laughs> it's in a rendezvous in Paris. It's where Edith Piaf sang on the streets, parallel the show. She goes, okay, okay, that sounds good. I was staying there with my friend her, and her daughter was the same age as my son. Then I wrote Murder in the Sentier because I was trying, I was trying to take a bus. I missed it and I started walking and got lost. And I said, I don't know where I am, but this is amazing. So that's the Sontier. And it kind of went on from there, but it was also like a, a story from that district, murder in Saint-Germain, that, you know, that crime happened there. So I, I used that. So it's just that now, I mean, this book, I only have one more around this month to go. So I'm kind of in a corner. So have have people that you know over there suggested, oh, you should do it in this arrondissement uh, because would they have this great thing there that you could, et cetera, et cetera? Have they come, oh, sure. have suggestions come from people over there? Sure, sure. You know, the 15th arrondissement where Port, where Port de Versailles is at the edge of, the population is the size of Bordeaux. It's big. No big monuments, you know, so you've probably gone through it. Um, you can see the Eiffel Tower off to the right. There's a very chic slice that borders the seventh arrondissement, the Shishi, you know, where I killed people and murdered in the Champ de Mars there. <laughs> and it, so it's very, um, it's very family oriented. It's very residential. And Hidalgo, the mayor of Paris lives there. Francois Hollande, the old uh, mayor, president, who had the affair with the woman when he rode his moped. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he lives there. You gotta there. love France. And it's very residential, you know, it's very, um, there used to be a lot of workers there, <clears throat> um, you know, and there's these little pockets of two-story homes that are gorgeous. I mean, they were used to be workers' houses, but so it's, it's really nice. It's very, it's kind of after you, after you graduate university, you get your job, you have your family, you want, you're not clubbing anymore, you go live there. <laughs> so. I, I, I want to point out to everyone who's watching that Kara is in a hotel room in Pasadena and the sun is going down as she's talking to us. So slowly, she things are getting a little darker on your end. I'm Cara. sorry. sorry. No, that's fine. We can still see you quite nicely. But um, I just wanted people to know it's not their screens. It's getting darker in Pasadena. Uh, hey, so you haven't been back to Paris since the pandemic uh, um, settled on us? No, I went in September when I did the workshop. <laughs> And, in and, Bordeaux and in Paris. Okay. Yeah. And so, so what pandemic. Changes, yes. What changes did, did you see changes in Paris as a result of the pandemic? Were people doing things differently? Were they was there a different timber to the city as a result? Well, I mean, we're all wearing masks. You had to show your a vaccination, you know, on your phone. Um, things were pretty pretty locked down still, but people were outside at the cafes, you know, kind of like we have here, you know, outside in the streets. Um, the museums had reopened, but the, everything is by reservation. So even it's, you know, like the Carnivalet Museum, the museum, I couldn't wait to go there. It's been closed for two years for renovation. It's free, but you still have to reserve, you know, to yeah. go in there. So yeah. they're really cutting down on all that, all the museums. Um, I had to have all my, uh, you know, vaccination to get on the, the, the fast train to go to Bordeaux and you know, it's uh, so now, but again, it just changed. I think something just changed. So it's emerged. I mean, what I can say about September, you know, now it might be different. So, yeah. um, but I felt people were very happy to be outside talking to each other on the, you know, at a cafe. It was just wonderful. You know, it was, and that's where people were doing it. They were doing it outside, you know, and there's heaters there and stuff. So, I mean, it was, but it was warm in September. It was gorgeous. So it was, it was like what I imagine we have here, maybe what you will when the snow melts, but you know, yeah. you're going to have, you know, just to be outside and we all lots rush of walking and soak up the sunshine here in the, in Minnesota. Uh, you know, you, you, uh, you just alluded to cafes in Paris and you know, it's, it's such an iconic thing to think of writers writing in the cafes in Paris. 
when you go to Paris, do you do some of your writing there when you're as, a, as one of the uh, folks who wrote in here steeped in the culture and the place? I mean, I wish I could, you know, no, I'm just, I'm there to work. I'm there to yeah. take notes. I'm there to meet people. I'm there to photograph, to, to, to record things, to meet as many people as I can. I go kind of nuts that way. You know, if you'll talk to me, I will meet you. You know, I mean, I, and I met two um, police and, and all these people like on my last day and I crammed it all in. I was, thank God they were, you know, so I have to take these people when they can see me. I mean, they're busy people, they work hard. You know, I go up to the, where they get their, the, this woman who's a, a female, she's, she's a whole book could be written about this woman. If you think Amy's cool, I mean, this woman is super cool. And she wears these little Louis heeled boots, you know, and she's a, she's a homicide detective, you know. And that's one thing someone told me about Amy. They like Amy because she never lets up and she never dresses down. And I mean, I think women don't, and I don't think they have to in France. But so I try and see as many people as I can to get as much information, to be a sponge. Then I come home, I digest on the plane and I start to write. You know, I mean, it's fits and starts, but there I'm there to gather. Yeah. Gathering. Love. Soak it up. Then you can squeeze it out when you're back home. Um, so we have a question that sort of goes along ex with exactly what you were just saying. Um, have you figured out the code of dressing like a Parisienne? <laughs> you know, I've, I've never figured out, you know, everybody there was wearing those white sneakers. You know that. I mean, yeah. it's like, where's those? Heels? I don't know that, you know? but yeah. <laughs> They're like, it's so cool to wear these white sneakers, you know, and then they, you know, they do pull out the heels. Um, I, you know, I'll never, I'll never be French. I just never will. But my big moment is that when I wear my little le trench, you know, the trench coat, my le trench, and I'm somewhere and from behind, and someone comes up and asks me in French, you know, where is this, you know? And for a moment, and you know, I'm I'm Parisian, right? And I don't want to blow it. So I go, you know, and then I walk away because I'm mean. No, but I do that because I can, you know, they think oh, she's just, she doesn't know. And, and so I don't blow it because the minute I open my mouth and I can speak French, they know my accent is, is not, you know, I'm not French. Yeah, can they I identify? Can they identify uh, from your accent that you are American when you speak French? Sure. They, they can pin you. Okay. Unless, yeah, and the, and my friends, my French friends are going, they'll only speak to me in French and they're going, your accent's getting better all the time. So I, I think, you know, Good. that kind of, <laughs> but I think it's true. You just kind of, um, what I found in France and Paris over the years, especially kids, you know, young people, it's always, they chop off the end, end of the word. And it's very, um, uh, uh abbreviated so and and there and some people have have questioned me on this but i've heard it instead of seeing something like bonjour bonjour for bonjour you know it's like well just say the whole word you know you know what i mean <laughs> I just, yeah. so there i've noticed that there is sort of an argo when they talk about a woman which is a femme not a pejorative they they uh, invert it and they call her mouf so that thumb over there, that roof over there, I'm like, what? You know, yeah, so you've got to, you know, that's a whole You know, we, prob we probably have a lot of the same sort of things going on in our language, but it's so natural to us. We just, uh, we just don't think about it or notice it. We are uh, approaching the end of our time, but before we leave, I, I want to ask you, is there another MA in the works? Are you working on your next standalone? Oh, the next standalone is a follow-up uh, two, three hours in Paris. I guess that's what yes. we call it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Kate Reese. Um, it's 1942 and there's trouble. What can I say? It's kind of midway in the world. Well, midway depends which, uh, you know, in the European theater. So, um, yeah, Kate's coming back March 23, March, 2023. Oh, and then I'm working on, and, and you know what the title is? No. I'm so bad with titles. I had to ask Reese Bowen, who gave me the title. <laughs> She's really good at, I mean, mine are just murder in, murder at, right? She said, ah, night flight to Paris. Ooh, nice. Like it. Yeah, nice. I give Reese all the credit, yeah. <laughs> oh, that Reese, she's, she's uh, quite a wonderful uh, person. Yeah, good for you. So, um, yeah, what about you? 
and wait a minute, I haven't let you go yet. So, but you still have more ME. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm working on that now. Um, yes, uh -huh. the last Durandi small. So I have to write 21 books because I goofed up and put two books in one Durandi small. Can okay. anybody guess? Oh, Sue Trowbridge is here. Hi, Sue. Hi, Sue. Hey. <laughs> Sue Trowbridge is our wonderful social media person. She makes us look so good uh, on all the social platforms. Thank you so much, Sue. Uh, let's see. You asked about me. Well, let's see. I have a new book coming out in my Cork O'Connor series in August. It's called Fox Creek. It's number will be number 19 in my series. And uh, I have two more under contract. And I am then working on the next standalone novel as well. So pretty busy guy these days. Can we have a, a, just a hint or a whiff of the next standalone? Just a just the era, just something, something. No, not to give it a. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. I'm, not not until I'm really sure of it will I. Uh, okay. Will I that. Yeah. So I want to change um, it. Uh, let's see. I'm going to ask if Bailey is still with us, if she would like to come back on and bid adieu to all of those folks who were kind enough to join us this evening. Yes, yes, yeah. We've reached the top of the hour here, so. Um, just want to thank everyone so much for joining us. Um, it was really, truly a pleasure to host both Cara and, and Kent here. Um, please consider purchasing a copy uh, of A Murder at the Port de Versailles. Unfortunately, I don't have a physical copy, but I thought I would show off the 19th installment here. I know Kent does. Yeah, he can, he can put it up <laughs> there for us. Fantastic. Um, and hey. Kent's uh, numerous books here I have with me is This Tender Land. Um, I a all wonderful those story. Books. Yeah, I've linked all of the books um, in the chat here, so easy access there. Um, I've also added a link to our YouTube YouTube channel where this event will be posted um, in the next couple of days. So if you would like to rewatch or you want to share with someone who wasn't able to uh, attend tonight, you can access that there. Uh, we look forward to seeing everyone at a, another one of our author events again soon. And until then, just take care and thank you so much for, for being here. Thank you, Bailey. Thank you so much, Ken. Thank you, everybody. You're welcome. Good night, all.